The Ukraine crisis was entirely caused by the EU and, naturally, by their American collaborators and, one can say, masters. Any information from Kyiv cannot be trusted, certainly due to Biden administration's policy. Many more Ukrainian civilians will die. Hello, you are watching Big Hughes. Hello, I am Anastasia Yusenko. Today's episode is about the army. Although, no, you still have to earn the right to be called an army. We are talking about a bunch of propagandists who are turning the audience against Ukraine in different countries of the world. Why talk about them at all? Because against the backdrop of a record increase in Western assistance, the Russians have started a new wave of hysteria, which they are trying to spread around the world. Every time they hear about Abrams or Leopards, they start launching missiles or kamikaze drones at us, and those who supply this important equipment to us face Russian information attacks. And they do it with the help of the same pro-Kremlin talking heads. Their task is standard to voice the usual Russian propaganda ideas, dear world, let's put up with Russia. Let's be friends with Russia, let's be afraid of Russia. Abandon Ukraine at last. However, this is funny and familiar to us. But the problem is that all this is being poured into the ears of citizens of many countries who may not be very aware of what exactly is happening here and may not have access to other sources of information. Diplomats, teachers, politicians, journalists, generals, and even ex-intelligence officers are sowing fear and doubt, playing along with the Kremlin. Who are they? What are they trying to convince Ukraine's Western partners of? What tools do they use? And most importantly, how can all this verbal mayhem still be so destructive against us? Let us analyze all this with the example of several countries. Let's start with Germany, which, let's face it, has been hesitant to take any serious decisions since the beginning of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Yes, this can be explained by history because Germany has had and still has a lot in common with Russia. More than 40 years of the Soviet Union's presence in half of this country not only raised several generations but also created the basis for further cooperation and well, let's call it friendship. Therefore, the old German elites were simply not used to clashing with the Russians, who were once very important to them. The German authorities hesitated from the start. While some were bringing javelins and laws to fight Russian tanks, the Germans promised to provide helmets. It was telling. Then came the titanic diplomatic work, the condemnation of citizens, and pressure from the leaders of other civilized countries. And now we are getting leopards from Germany. For us, this is a war with the Germans, not even with the Ukrainians anymore, with Germans. And when they start sending leopards there, Simonian wrote correctly on her telegram, don't cover up the Nazi crosses. For us, these are all Germans. Continuation of the Great Patriotic War. The Russians are doing their best to pull Germany back. They engage the media for this purpose. And unfortunately, this task does not seem difficult because there are plenty of pro-Russian speakers in the German media. Now these words have an impact on the audience. It hurts the West, Europe in particular, more than Russia. The German Center for Monitoring, Analysis and Strategy surveyed Germans about the Russian-Ukrainian war, first in April and then in October 2022, and compared the answers. In April, 29 percent of Germans agreed with the statement that Russia's invasion of Ukraine was the result of NATO provocations. In October, this figure rose to 40 percent. In April, 14 percent of Germans fully or partially agreed with Russia's favorite talking point that the war was necessary to remove the fascist government in Ukraine. In October, the number was already 24 percent. 
Some six months passed between the polls, which is an extremely short period for people to change their minds so dramatically out of the blue and even more so, to become so abruptly supportive of conspiracy theories. Well, obviously, someone helped them. One of the main mouthpieces of pro-Russian propaganda in Germany is Helga Zepp Larouche, the founder of the Schiller Institute, which is represented in several countries, and a political expert. To avoid getting into too much detail about the Schiller Institute, I'd rather show you a part of this video where the choir of the Institute with St. George's ribbons sings the Russian anthem to commemorate the Russians who died in a plane crash. This was, by the way, in 2016. No, no, there is nothing wrong with commemoration. It's the ribbons and the anthem that are out of place. This is a perfect characterization. The Institute has its own YouTube channel, where Zepp Larouche regularly posts her streams, discussing world politics and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Almost 70. Well, so far, 70,000 subscribers hear this from the political expert. All you had to do is go back to diplomacy. You could reopen Nord Stream 2, which is ready to go. You could get Nord Stream 1 function again. You could cooperate to solve this problem, rather than going into a winter of complete discontent. The West seems to be like lemmings running towards the cliff, towards self-destruction. During a meeting with his cabinet, Putin said that the sanctions are leading to a fuel price inflation. They are like an auto -def. Sounds familiar? Yes, in a slightly different form. But these statements are constantly found in the Russian media. And here's a recent one, by the way. Zepp Larouche comments on Schultz's decision to transfer the leopards to Ukraine. Well, rather criticizes it, calling it a tragedy for Germany. Решення уряду Німеччини піддатися масштабному зовнішньому тиску щодо відправки танків Леопард-2 в Україну є прикладом трагедії Німеччини, яка реагує як окупована країна. Під сильним тиском США, Британії та НАТО рішення, оголошене сьогодні в Берліні, є ще одним прикладом трагічних наслідків, коли немає зобов'язань щодо серйозних переговорів. Zepp Larouche criticizes and at the same time calls on Germans to rally against this. A protest is already scheduled for February 19. The German propagandist's pro-Russian rhetoric is now new. Here is a fragment of her speech in December 2014 at a conference at a Russian university, of course. If you listen to the speech, President Putin gave a speech to both houses of the Russian Federation. He said one thing that is absolutely clear. It is not about Ukraine that the present crisis is all about. Who is this expert? Zepp Larouche is the widow of the American politician Lyndon Larouche. She was fascinated by Schiller, studied him, organized symposia dedicated to him and prepared reports. In the 2000s, she became concerned with violence and video culture, criticized the Pachman cult, and then traveled to Russia and spoke at the State Duma on the topic of global financial destabilization. Step by step in 2014, Sepp Larouche began to promote openly pro-Russian views actively. The Ukraine crisis was entirely caused by the EU and, naturally, by their American collaborators. And, one can say, masters, media outlets in Russia continue to pick up her quotes. Of course, in their anti-Ukrainian messages, they refer not to some Rogozin or Medvedev, but to an authoritative source, a political expert from Germany. 
конкретне джерело – політичну експертку з Німеччини. According to German politician Helga Zeplarush, the world is threatened by a third world war. This time a nuclear one, which would result in the extinction of all humanity. To prevent such a scenario, the West needs to cooperate with Russia rather than compete with it. Director of the Schiller Institute, more and more countries realize the futility of sanctions. Another mouthpiece of Russian propaganda in Germany is Alice Schwarzer, a journalist, columnist, and founder of the German feminist magazine Emma. Schwarzer started her career in France where she launched a feminist movement and then moved to Germany, where she also worked with the feminist movement. Everything would have been fine, but in 2022, with the beginning of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, Schwarzer immediately switched from feminism to politics. In April last year, Schwarzer initiated a petition addressed to Schultz on the pages of the feminist magazine calling for a halt to arms supplies to Ukraine. Schwarzer was supported in this by three dozen German public figures, artists, musicians, directors, writers, and journalists. In total, almost half a million people have signed the petition. We weren't against making a double mistake first. The responsibility for the risk of escalation to a nuclear conflict lies solely with the initial aggressor, not with those who openly provide it with a motive for possibly criminal actions. On the other hand, the decision on the moral responsibility of further costs of human lives among the Ukrainian civilian population is solely within the competence of their government. The propagandists found Schultz's weakness, his doubts. Well, this is what I was talking about. They began to focus on it. The petition, by the way, was immediately responded to by Ukraine's ambassador to Germany at the time, Andrei Melnik, who publicly addressed Schwarzer. Your call for Ukraine's surrender means that your famous feminism is just a cover and a fake. Accepting the mass rape of Ukrainian women by Russian soldiers is pure cynicism. I don't want anyone in their right mind to buy your Emma. Schwarzer's column in Emma is also called Schwarzer. Schwarzer often devotes this column to the topic of Ukraine. Well, how often? Almost constantly. Too often for a feminist magazine. And no, it's not about Ukrainian women in the armed forces or about women in general. It is about Ukraine having to surrender. President Zelensky and his dubious ambassador to Germany are now constantly demanding more heavy weapons from the West. On behalf of the victims, but do the weapons really serve to protect the population, or do they cause more casualties? And do all the soldiers in Ukraine really want to be heroes? Yes, you heard it right. You could see and hear similar notions about more weapons, more victims, about forced mobilization in Ukraine, and about discrediting the Ukrainian army in the Russian media at the beginning of the invasion. In Ukraine, men are once again being served with summonses. Military officers are tracking them down in the most unexpected places, in public transportation, markets, bars and restaurants. At the same time, men cannot leave the country legally. As a result, some pay bribes for forged documents, while others cross the border in the mountains and swim across icy rivers. It is very important how it is presented. In terms of, yes, there is a war in Ukraine, and sometimes people may be served with summonses in public transport or on the street. And yes, law enforcement officers occasionally catch men dressed as women trying to cross the border. But these are isolated cases that are presented as systemic. And in another column in her own feminist magazine, Schwarzer goes on to try to discredit the Ukrainian government, but in a very disgusting way, not through the president himself, the government, or their decisions, but through criticizing Zelensky's wife. While soldiers are dying on the front line and women are raped in the rear, First Lady Olena Zelenska is posing for fashion. What is the purpose of, to persuade the average German that while the Germans themselves have to struggle because they are imposing sanctions on Russia, the wife of the Ukrainian president is featured in fashion magazines? Despite this stance, 
Schwarzer is regularly invited to talk shows by German television channels. This is an excerpt from the weekly program, May Schwerber, in which guests discuss the most pressing political issues. The show is broadcast on one of the largest television channels in Germany. This war is not only a defensive war of Ukraine against Russia, but, of course, it is also war between America and Russia on Ukrainian soil. The Russian media, of course, picked up on this speech by Alice Schwarzer. They made her a heroine in their headlines. German journalist and activist Alice Schwarzer reprimands Ukrainian reporter Vassil Holod over arms supplies. The activist calcinate state's intervention in the Ukrainian crisis to fight Russia proxy conflict. German journalist and activist Alice Schwarzer has demanded to stop military aid to Ukraine. What is the reason for the recent increase in Germans believing Russian propaganda? Exactly this. Johannes Warwick is a professor of international relations and a German political scientist who supports the views of Russian propagandists. It was he who ran into a public discussion with the aforementioned Ukrainian ex-ambassador Andrei Melny. Warwick criticized the Ukrainian counteroffensive, and Melnik sent him after the Russian warship. Consider it getting acquainted. From the very beginning of the invasion, Warwick had been telling the public that Germany should stand aside in the Russian-Ukrainian war and not to help us with weapons. We are giving Ukraine false hope. Our current course has not yet led to success and will end in disaster. We are walking on the edge of a knife. Today we are talking about armed the arsenal carriers, tomorrow tanks. Then we will offer air support and send in troops. Warwick, of course, also uses the theme of the nuclear threat from Russia and accordingly calls for a truce at any cost. Because he is scared. The Ukrainians are fighting and Warwick is scared, imagine that. But it should be understood that this is also a tool, sowing fear and uncertainty. When fear and uncertainty are multiplied by additional intimidation and panic, it can lead to hysteria. It can lead to mass hysteria, which is exactly what the Kremlin needs. We must avoid this at almost any cost. And almost any price means that we maintain the ability to compromise, seek political solutions, and avoid betting on the war. It is ironic that German leaders themselves have to extinguish these messages inflamed by pro-Russian propagandists. For example, recently, the leader of Schultz's party said that Putin would not go to nuclear clear escalation because of the supply of weapons to Ukraine. I am not afraid. Putin will not intimidate us. With his visit to Beijing and his actions together with Joe Biden at the G20 summit, Olaf Scholz contributed to a significant reduction in the nuclear threat. Putin realized that if he crossed this line, he would lose key allies such as the Chinese. But the Russian media, of course, used Warwick's statements in their headlines. Well, as expected. In fact, this process is a vicious circle. Foreign pro-Kremlin speakers simultaneously pre to their audience and, at the same time, to the Russian audience, where Russians reinforce what they say with honorifics and titles of politician, diplomat, professor, and so on, giving Russian content consumers the false idea that the world fears and respects them, that they are winning and relentlessly grinding down anti-Russian sentiment. All of this is confirmed by the head of the NSTIS Center for Countering Disinformation, Andrei Shapoval. It was the Russian media that created this image for their agents of respected experts. Look, this is a professor, this is an ex-intelligence officer, Sir. This is a former military man. That is, they actually used their agents to create the image of very serious and respected experts. Now let's summarize. What messages are the Russians, through their middlemen, trying to impart to Germans? The need for Ukraine to negotiate with Russia as soon as possible, and it is unnecessary to transfer weapons to Ukraine. What tools are they using for this? They are trying to frighten ordinary Germans with dire consequences and, at the same time, discredit Ukraine in a rather disgusting way through all available media platforms they can exploit, social media, websites, magazines, 
even national television. What goal are they trying to achieve? To influence German aid to Ukraine, including the supply of weapons. This is a very old and very complicated story that goes back to the end of the Second World War. Russians are skillful at using all the triggers that exist for Germany today. The supposed historical memory and therefore the supply of weapons and intervention in the conflict in general was not so easy and so quick from the German point of view. The United States began supporting Ukraine before the Russian invasion and continues to do so actively today with information, weapons, and influence on other countries that had some doubts about assistance and the organization of military exercises. But every action is always countered. So all this time, a certain resistance movement has been maturing and developing in the United States. Who is its foundation? A part of the Republicans that is guided by the previous president, Donald Trump. Trumpists who have long been suspected of having ties to Russia, and Russia in turn of influencing this group of people in the United States. Everything would be fine if these people did not have influence, money, and powerful media platforms on which to broadcast pro-Kremlin messages. Jim Yopras is an American, former diplomat and former advisor to the Republican Party leadership in the United States in eight who now often serves as an expert for Russian propaganda media, which, of course, do not forget to point out that Yatras was an American diplomat. Here, for example, is how he comments on the Russian atrocities in Irpin and Butch. Any information from Kyiv cannot be trusted. Fakes are part of the information war waged by Ukraine. So now we don't take words like atrocity seriously without an official investigation. On the eve of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, Yatras defended the Moscow Patriarchate and even appeared in a Russian propaganda film about the church split in Ukraine, made by a Russia One television channel host. They have created a structure of ideology that combines ideology against Christian morality, business, money, the intelligence community. All of these were integrated together and directed against Russia and against the Orthodox Church. Also featured in the film, by the way, was Vadim Nivinsky, a former Ukrainian who recently resigned and got sanctioned by the National Security and Defense Council. But that's a minor detail. The ways in which the correct Kremlin-influenced information is conveyed in Germany and the United States differ. In the United States, speakers who play along with Russia generally do not use scaremongering because the United States Army is still among the most powerful in the world. They criticize Ukraine less often, instead focusing on the American government, which is helping Ukraine. Graham Fuller is an American writer and political analyst. He is a former CII officer with 30 years of service. He served as the CII station chief in Kabul. Fuller studied at Harvard. In addition, he earned a master's degree in Russian studies, a comprehensive study of the Russian language, history, literature, and culture. Fuller is also known for publicly criticizing Biden for calling Vladimir Putin a murderer. Quite telling, isn't it? Fuller can be seen on many different media outlets, and he carefully collects these numerous publications on his website. Probably his age, he is over 80, and his former titles create an image of a powerful and respected expert, which is exploited by both American and Russian media. What are experts allowed to do? They are allowed to make very big, almost sensationalist statements. Here is one of them from June 2022, at the same time last summer. Fuller was also a guest on Solovyov's radio program. The recording was for a Russian audience, so it exists online only with Russian dub. 
I apologize. Russian dot United States is becoming an increasingly weak country. The world is becoming multipolar. We are seeing the growth and strengthening of the influence of other countries, China, Russia, India, and other BRICS countries. Weak America and strong Russia are Fuller's main themes. The American propagandist continues to build all his subsequent speeches around this theme. The sanctions that the West continues to impose on Russia end up having a much more destructive impact on European countries and other regions of the world than on the Russian economy. Well, yes, you might be experiencing deja vu. You have definitely heard this before from the Kremlin's propaganda media. Sanctions are not working and have no impact on Russia. Russia will survive, but they have hit Europe hard and all Europeans will soon freeze. Yes, the geographical locations are different, but the speakers have the same talking points. We have noticed that Fuller's articles are often published on the website of the United States Rand Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity. This institute poses as an educational institution specializing in political science, but for some reason, even the home page of their website looks more like a tabloid. For example, the headline is Top 20 Most Cringeworthy Zelensky Promoments. The article begins with the words, United States Empire's Proxy War in Ukraine. Among these, the authors mention Zelensky's cover for Times, the president's wife's photo shoot for Vogue, Zelensky's appearance on Netflix, a meeting with Biden and the Ukrainian flag in the United States Congress. All of these, according to the authors, are the most cringeworthy for moments. This is where the methods used by pro-Kremlin figures in Germany and the United States are similar. They also tried to discredit the Ukrainian government at a time when the whole world was talking about it. You know what? This weird institute is often cited by Russian media, including quoting Fuller himself, who is the founder of the institute, Ron Paul, politician, a former Republican congressman who has previously run for president twice. His son, Rand Paul, a Republican United States Senator, joined the effort last spring at the height of Russia's offensive against Ukraine to slow down the delivery of another installment of United States aid. The relevant bill was supposed to be voted on in the Senate and sent to Biden for his signature, but it was Rand Paul who demanded that the bill include amendments that would delay the provision of aid for several weeks. I don't think it's necessary to explain what delaying the aid for several weeks means for us. And you know, this fact points to another interesting pattern. The Russians act in a comprehensive manner. Every information attack is followed by an offensive. This was the case in Ukraine until February last year, when pro-Russian propagandists were trying to confuse Ukrainians on the eve of a real offensive. This is what they do now in the countries they can reach. The information attacks are the same everywhere, but offensives may be any direct action, such as the situation with Paul. And this is Tucker Carlson, an American journalist and television host, of course with the prefix pro-Russian propagandist. Carlson has his own show on the American Fox News channel, where he talks a lot about Ukraine. In the 2021, Carlson's evening show became the most popular news show in United States cable television, with an average audience of more than 3 million viewers per episode. And this is what his audience consumes the day that war began. So the day that war began, which was February 24, two things were very obvious. The first was that there was no way the Ukrainian army would be able to win a decisive military victory over Russia, and the reason was simple. Russia is too big. Ukraine is too small. The Russian military is many times the size of the Ukrainian military. Plus, of course, it has nuclear weapons. Carlson's affinity for Russia did not emerge in 2022. He had demonstrated it before. For example, long before the invasion of Ukraine, Carlson said that America should make friends with Russia to defeat ISIS. 
The full-scale war has added many shades to this affinity. We know now that the war in Ukraine is certainly not about helping the Ukrainian people. Those poor people, many more Ukrainian civilians, will die certainly, thanks to the Biden administration's policies. So that's not their goal, saving Ukraine, saving human lives. No, that's not their goal. Instead, the war in Ukraine is designed to cause regime change in Moscow. They want to topple the Russian government. Of course, the Russian media are eager to take Carlson's words for their headlines every time. Moreover, the Russians have even made a separate YouTube channel with Carlson's speeches with Russian translations. Russian dub, Joe Biden has just announced that against our interests, we are going to send missile batteries, armored vehicles and many other things to Ukraine endlessly. Against our own interests is an understatement. By doing this, we are disarming our own country. The Insta Center for Countering Disinformation monitors how such injections from pro-Russian propagandists around the world are carried out simultaneously as if on cue. We observe that the support for these narratives on social media is artificial. The number of bots that was used in the promotion of this or that narrative, the number of comments, and how many of those are authentic. Accordingly, we can see how artificially this bubble is being inflated around the narratives favorable to Russia. This is where we come back to the motives as soon as America prepares another aid package for Ukraine. Pro-Russian talking heads become active, telling that they shouldn't help Ukraine. And actually, America is weak. And sanctions don't work. Well, you heard it all before. To summarize, I would like to say, first of all, that we should not underestimate either Russian propaganda or the enemy's psy ops. It is very important that you and I, as well as audiences around the world, can identify their specific markers. Why did this information appear right now at this moment? Who is the person pushing these messages? Which platform was used? How did Russian propaganda react to this? What are they trying to convince us of? All these questions are important. The days of blindly quoting something because an American intelligence officer or a German professor said are long gone. These titles and regalia may conceal an ordinary Russian propagandist. And one more thing. Today, we have talked about only two countries, but there are plenty of pro-Russian propagandists in many others. Do you like this format? Should we continue? And if so, what could be improved? Please leave your suggestions in the comments. And that's all for today. Do not believe everything you read. Believe in the armed forces of Ukraine and see you soon. Dear friends, I'm still raising money for the Radio Reconnaissance Unit. So if you want to join, the link to the Minobank jar is in the comments. Thank you.